latest episode of Mr. Shirley's Snapshot Science. Now, in today's video, we're going to be looking at controlling body temperature. Now, hopefully by the end of this video, you're able to, one, describe how temperature is monitored in the body. We then want to go on to explain how the body maintains a constant temperature. And finally, we want to explain the negative feedback loop. So don't start sweating, let's get right into it. Now, guys, the environment surrounding an organism is constantly changing. Imagine if you yourself, if you're outside, it could be cold, it could be hot. However, the, cell, the cells maintain a constant environment, okay? The internal environment of an organism must remain constant within a narrow limit, okay? This internal environment makes reference to the temperature, body temperature, internal temperature, okay? The amount of water, okay, inside the temperature, the amount of glucose in the blood, etc. They all must be kept constant. Now, maintaining a constant internal environment within narrow limits is known as homeostasis, okay? So homeostasis is essentially maintaining a constant internal uh, environment. So for example, if you used to look at this uh, chart right here, okay? And this, imagine this baseline was representing body temperature, a uh, constant body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, the body temperature must be kept within a narrow limit. So this peak here could be 37.5 uh, degrees Celsius, and this shop here could be 36.5. But we don't want our body temperature to leave this narrow limit, okay? And that is homeostasis. Now, some animals can keep their temperature constant themselves, okay? Animals that can do this are known as endothermic animals, okay? These could be uh, mammals and birds, they're all known as endothermic, okay? This means that they can get their heat energy from within. Their heat energy comes from within. If an organism cannot do this, they're known as ectothermic, okay? And here's some examples, okay? We have this leopard, which is endothermic, okay? It can uh, maintain a constant temperature from within. And we have this snake here, which is ectothermic, okay? Now, guys. Being an endothermic animal has its advantages. It means that, for example, the temperature can remain at 30, around 37 degrees. It can remain within that narrow limit. Why is this a benefit? Okay, this benefits enzymes activities. Don't forget, guys, you studied enzymes, and you know that enzymes have uh, an opt optimum temperature that they work at. Okay, it means that metabolism can keep going in endothermic um, organisms, even if it's cold. So, for example, endothermic organisms can keep moving in the cold when it's sometimes too cold for an ectothermic uh, organism to move, all right? There is a downside, okay, of being an endothermic animal, okay? And the downside is that it requires a lot of energy. Maintaining a constant internal temperature requires a lot of energy. So it means that endothermic animals have to eat a lot more food, all right? Now, guys. We're, before we look at maintaining a constant temperature, it's important that we get familiar with the skin because the skin is really important in terms of temperature regulation. There's this diagram here from page 180 okay, of the CIE textbook. If you're in my class, I'll print this out for you to add to your notes. Okay? But make sure you're familiar with the different layers of the skin. Okay? So the human skin is made of two layers. We have the top layer, which is known as the epidermis, and we have the bottom layer, which is known as the dermis, okay? So you have the two layers, all right? Now, all the cells in the epidermis that you can see have been made in the base just below the epidermis. Now, these cells divide by mitosis, and they gradually move up to the surface. Now, as the closer and closer they get to the surface, eventually they die. These cells die, and what happens is when they die, they fill with a protein known as keratin, okay? Now, they, these cells, the dead cells, which are full of the protein keratin, okay, form the top layer, all right? And they're known as the cornified layer, okay? Now, why is the cornified layer, which is essentially dead cells full of keratin, important, okay? It's important because it protects the cells underneath, okay, the living cells which are underneath, because it's one hard and two, it's also waterproof. Okay, so that's the cornified layer. Now guys, 
you also have some cells which contain a dark pigment. This pigment is known as melanin. Okay, I'm sure you've all heard of it. Okay, melanin absorbs all of the harmful ultraviolet rays which are coming from the sun. Okay, this is really important to protect the cells. Okay, now in places, okay, we have, if we continue to look at our skin diagram, we have essentially an inward fold of the epidermis. Okay, and this inward fold forms what we know, what is known, sorry, as a hair follicle. All right, and in this hair follicle, we have a hair which grows, and this hair is made from keratin. Okay, keratin is a protein. Okay, so there's a hair in each hair follicle. All right, now, if we go on to look at the dermis now, the dermis is mainly made of connective tissue, okay? This tissue contains essentially elastic fibers and also collagen fibers. Now, it's these fibers, okay, that as you get older, they lose their elasticity, okay? They're not as stretchy, and that's what makes um, wrinkles appear on your skin as you age. Obviously, my skin will be forever useful, forever youthful, so I won't get wrinkles, inshallah. Okay? Now, guys, the dermis also contains, all right, and you can see this clearly if you have the diagram in front of you, sweat glands, all right? And these sweat glands produce sweat. What is sweat? It's mainly water, but it also contains water, sorry, it also contains salt and urea, okay? And we're going to look at why sweat is important um, in in a few moments time. Now, the dermis also contains blood vessels and nerve endings. These nerve endings are sensitive to things such as touch, pain, pressure, and importantly, temperature, because they can help you maintain a constant environ, vi environmental condition, okay? And that's uh, the nerve endings which are in the skin, okay? Now, under the epidermis, as you guys can see, if you're looking at your diagram, you have a layer of fat, and this is known as adipose tissue, okay? Now, adipose tissue, this fatty tissue, mainly contains large cells, sorry, tiny cells, which contain large droplets of oil. Now, why is this important? Because it's this layer, okay, of fatty tissue that helps insulate your body. And we're going to relate back to this. Now... There's a part of your brain, and this part of the brain is known as the hypothalamus, okay? And the hypothalamus helps keep the internal temperature constant. Now, the hypothalamus helps in coordinating the activities of parts of the body that bring about changes. So let's look at how the hypothalamus can help. The hypothalamus itself, which is um, in the brain, okay, part of the brain, has temperature receptors. Now, if the temperature of the blood, which is flowing through the hypothalamus, drops, the hypothalamus will send electrical impulses along nerves, as we've looked at before, to effectors which will essentially help regulate body temperature. So the hypothalamus is really important because it uh, detects temperature drops in the blood, which is flowing through it, and will send electrical signals along nerves to effectors around the body. So let's look at what happens if you get too cold. You've walked into your favourite mall, Bellagio, okay, and it's too cold. The first thing that will happen, and keep looking at your skin, um, your skin diagrams, guys, is you have erectile, erectile muscles, okay, which contract. These erectile muscles are, con um, they're attached to hair, the hairs, okay, and when they contract, they pull the hair and make the hairs stand on end. So if you have the hair standing on end, what happens is these hairs actually trap a layer of air. And this layer of air acts as an insulator. Okay? If you're cold, your metabolism will increase. Okay? These reactions, are, which are part of your metabolism, produce heat. As you know, if you get really cold, you will start to shiver. Okay? This will generate heat. Why? Because shiver in itself, the muscular contractions, requires energy. The energy comes from respiration. Respiration will produce heat, okay? And then we have something, and it's a new concept to you guys now, vasoconstriction, okay? Now, what happens with vasoconstriction, okay? If you look at your diagram, the arterioles that supply the blood capillaries, okay, which are near the surface of the skin, they will get narrower. They will get smaller. Essentially, they will, the proper word is constrict. 
when they constrict, what happens is less blood goes to the capillaries near the surface of the skin, and the blood is redirected essentially to uh, capillaries which are lying deep underneath the skin, okay? And these capillaries are actually lying beneath the insulating fatty tissue, which we just looked at before, okay? What this means is that less blood is lost to the environment via radiation, okay? Because the blood is now flowing underneath here, okay? Underneath the fatty tissue, so it's insulated, so it's losing less heat compared to if it was higher up. So let's look at the opposite now. You've walked out of your favourite mall. Your car is parked 10 minutes away. It's the height of summer, okay? And it's too hot. What happens? The erector muscles, which are connected to the hairs, will relax. This will cause the hairs to lie, lie flat and essentially release the insulating layer of heat, okay? The sweat glands will release sweat, okay? And as the water from the sweat evaporates, this cools um, the skin down. Because evaporation itself requires energy, okay? And then the opposite to the new um, terminology that we just learned about is vasodilation. So what happens is the arterioles, which are supplying the capillaries near the surface of the skin, they will get wider. Essentially, they will dilate. That's the key terminology. When they dilate, it means that more blood flows closer to the surface of the skin. Okay, and this means that more heat can be lost from the blood via radiation, okay, to the air, okay? So that's really important. The two new concepts, vasoconstriction, if you're too cold, and vasodilation, if you're too hot. All right, and this is a nice summary, okay? Um, but use the notes from these two, vasodilation and constriction, because they go into great detail. All right, guys, again, this is looking at vasoconstriction and vasodilation. In vasoconstriction, the blood essentially flows under, uh, is redirected to the blood capillaries, which are underneath the fatty tissue, so it's insulated. In vasodilation, the blood flows closer to the surface, okay, so more heat can be lost via radiation. All right, guys? And finally, all of this is an example of the negative feedback loop. What does this mean, negative feedback loop? It means that when the hypothalamus send signals to your body, once you're, imagine you was too hot, okay, your blood uh, temperature started to rise too much, it was not 37.5, potentially going to creep up. When the hypothalamus sent that signal, okay, and the effects were brought about, which we've just learned about, your body starts to now cool down, a signal will be sent back to the hypothalamus, telling it the um, correct effects have happened, you can now stop sending the signal. And this is an example of negative feedback. So, hopefully you're now um, able to describe how temperature is monitored in the body. Hopefully you're also able to explain how the body maintains a constant temperature. And finally, hopefully you're able to explain the negative feedback loop. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and revise. Mr. Ashodi, signing out. Woo! Hot in here.